now that we've covered a broad overview of falsification of prior uncertainty, we're ready to do a substantial case study. So this case study involves an offshore turbidite reservoir. And we're at the stage of the appraisal of that reservoir. That means by means of seismic and well data, we'd like to know how much, say, oil in place we have. So that will depend on a number of things. It depends on the structural features of that uh, reservoir. And so if you're in a, a turbidite reservoir, you typically have these uh, canyons forming. So this is actually the sea floor where we see similar canyons that we have in the subsurface. So in these canyons, which you hear is a vertical uh, seismic section, we see that we have some sort of container. Now in this container, we have quite a lot of complexity, uh, which is due to lithological variations. What we'll focus on in particular in this case is because the container can be relatively easy imaged with seismic data, is what is the lithological complexity within this container? And how does the uncertainty on the lithological complexity affect then estimates of volume? So the geophysical data uh, is simply here seismic imaging data. So here we see several cross section of that container that I talked about previously. Uh, this is just a different line. And so we're interested in this uh, reservoir zone over here uh, that we'll be uh, dealing with. So in, in order to do so, there are some technical aspects that I'm not going to go too much uh, into is that we have to put everything in a stratigraphic coordinate system, uh, so removing any kind of tipping. Uh, and so what we end up with is, for example, here, the, uh, the canyon, which contains the lithology and the oil reservoir, is now uh, given on this particular grid. So we'll be focusing on, on this particular zone uh, in the, uh, in the uh, study. That means that we can um, create uh, a particular area zone, which is 100 meters thick, uh, and two at 1 to 5 by 1 kilometers wide. And that gives us a number of, of uh, cell sizes or voxel sizes. Okay, so as before, um, when we design uncertainty qualification problems and we're going through the process of falsification, we have to first define our prior uncertainty. So here uh, we can rely on substantial literature studies for channelized turbidite reservoirs in West Africa, because this is the, where the case study is coming from. And so in, in these uh, studies, we, we typically either have V or U-shaped valleys. And so here we have that U-shaped valley. Uh, and in that valley, we see that we have some uh, individual channel formations uh, that are stacking on top of each other and, 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 and finer scale uh, variations that we observe within this container. So the idea of uh, prior uncertainty uh, is to create models that reflect our lack of understanding about the, these kind of channel formations. So you have to understand that this uh, essentially is one is basically mapped onto this container. Um, so that's why we go from the actual grid into a depositional grid. And so we notice, and we'll talk in a bit about how we got this, uh, we notice that we, indeed we get a large variety of channel formation because of the large uncertainty from literature of the multiple possibilities that are available to us. So as before, uh, we start with a table. Uh, in any uncertainty qualification, it's really important to name uh, things properly and name their uncertainty and types and distributions. So here's just an overview, and in the next couple of slides, uh, I will go over those. But there's already a, a, a things of note. First of all, it's a lot to do with channel geometry, uh, which is this, then the proportion of channels uh, versus, and that's of course very important. For example, there are channels containing brine and there are channels containing oil. So we'd like to know those proportions. And initially, we see we have a very large uncertainty on that. Next to that, we have to know about the placement of channels. We don't know exactly where channels are. So that would be a statistical method. And then has a lot of uncertainties also related to the rock physics models, which allows us to uh, turn lithology into velocities and into uh, impedances and seismic signals. So let's go over the various uncertainties. So first of all, there is uh, we'll see in a bit that there's two rock physics models. Uh, there's one rock physics model that says there are basically only uh, two or three fishes, and the other that says three or four fishes. Uh, and so uh, in, in these kind of uh, distributions, we're just going to deal with some kind of minimum and maximum proportion, often obtained from, from literature studies. You see that these distributions are quite wide here. So then it comes geometric uncertainty. So uh, we have to have channels that are going to have a certain width and height, uh, and that um, actually those are typically related. So there's a width and a height ratio. And so from that, we can generate many uh, kind of geological models that have those variations in them. 
Then you have sinuosity. So sinuosity is actually something we also observe, as I mentioned before, on the seafloor uh, and or, or in uh, seismic data that's very shallow. And so from that, we can get some understanding of what are possible sinuosities here measured as wavelengths. And so those are from 1.25 kilometers to 5 kilometers. So here's one aspect of spatial uncertainty, which is the stacking pattern of the various channels. So we have uh, channels that can be stacked in various ways. Uh, as you notice, uh, one of them is uh, it's more isolated stacking. So we see the channels are more isolated from each other. Uh, one is where the channels are more spreading. Uh, so the aggregation is more uh, gradual. So we get this multilateral. And then when you have uh, stacking or multi-story channels, and it sort of uh, looks like this. So these are not three choices. So the uncertainty here is simply uh, an, an, a discrete variable that has these three choices. So with all that, uh, we do now an object-based simulation, which is a method by which uh, geometries are drawn from these prior distributions. And then these geometries are placed in, uh, in a space based on their stacking and some random uh, variation uh, within that. So we see that each model here, uh, many models are generated. They could each be uh, hypothesis. They're not necessarily a, an actual model of the reservoir. But they will allow us to, uh, to study whether the, the distributions that we specified actually can allow us to predict the observations that we have, which in this case is the geophysical data. OK, so to come to that, then we have to define the forward model. In the forward model, however, we have additional uncertainties. Um, we take a, the idea here is to take one of the model realizations and um, one of these model realizations and forward model the geophysical data, which is this the seismic data. So the way that goes is often through rock physics transforms. Uh, rock physics uh, methods are ways by which we can relate several uh, important rock physical properties, such as density and velocity, and relate them to lithology, such that from that we can then forward simulate uh, some geophysical data, for example, using, in this case, normal incidence convolution. The problem, however, is that this transformation, this rock physics transformation, is uncertain because the physics is not necessarily perfectly understood. Actually, as a matter of fact, in this case, one of the main problems was that uh, while in the well, well uh, logs, we only observed th three lithologies, namely oil sand, carbonate, cemented oil sand, and uh, shales, uh, there's also the, an indication potentially that we have a fourth uh, fishes that is not recorded in the, in the data. And so that is the brine sand. And so this can be added uh, here through um, the typical uh, fluid substitution methods. So if we, however, take a one specific model and one specific rock relationship, one of these choice, choices, we can then have run the forward model and get one data realization. Okay, so now we're ready to do the for the falsification process. Our hypothesis is that uh, with our current prior model, f of n of m, we can uh, predict the observations. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to turn um, our Monte Carlo of model realizations into Monte Carlo of data realizations and then evaluate uh, the, the, the observations in that distribution. So that would be this distribution. In order to do that, of course, the, the data itself is very high dimensional. It's a seismic data. Uh, we need to do dimension reduction. And so we'll talk about specific methods for dimension uh, reduction. So in order to illustrate that, and not on the complex case, we'll just uh, do a, a much more simpler case, but it's the same idea. So in this simpler case, again, we're going to generate channels, uh, and we have basically uh, three types of uncertainties. There are two possible proportions, 20% uh, and 30%. There are uh, two possible channel sizes, and there are two possible rock physics models. So in total, we have 16 possible uh, scenarios that are available to us. So for each scenario, um, we generate uh, a number of realizations. Uh, so we have, say, 50. We have in total 800 realizations for all these uh, scenarios. So then the next thing is, of course, is to take these model realizations and do forward modeling. And so again, we use the same idea as before. We use the rock physics model. We draw a rock physics model. And then uh, we generate the forward seismic uh, data. So now comes an important observation. 
So uh, traditionally, what we would do in, in his inversion uh, would be to try and uh, do the inverse problem, which say, if this is my actual observation, then what I'd like to do is try to figure out what the model is such that the forward simulated seismic data matches this field observation. So this is uh, certainly an important exercise, but prior to that exercise, we need to understand, uh, first of all, if our prior model can actually predict this field observation. It would make no sense to start inverse modeling with a prior that's essentially falsified. In that falsification uh, step, we don't need necessarily match the observations. It's also clear in this particular case, for example, that, um, that if I look at model one, generate uh, forward seismic models, and I look at the observations versus this model two, it's pretty clear that this model is, is a similar patterns in the field seismic than, uh, for example, this, uh, this other one. So, so there is a process of comparison that has nothing to do with um, sort of uh, an objective function. It has to do with to what degree do we get the same patterns in the forward simulated seismic as compared to the field seismic as a whole, not just any particular trace. And that allows us to do that falsification. One way of doing dimension reduction, as we've seen before, is uh, things about component analysis. But since we're dealing here with waveforms, we're going to use a different method, which is called wavelet analysis. So imagine you have this picture here that's given to you, and so you'd like to analyze this picture. And so one way of to analyze that picture is to uh, convolve it with a certain wavelet. And so that convolution will lead to picking out certain features. For example, that is shown here. Um, if I convolve it with a uh, high pass filter that runs from the left to the right, what I'll pick up is edges that are uh, strongly vertical. That will be these edges here. So here we see these strongly vertical edges. If I convolve that same wavelet uh, in one of these wavelets with, with um, in that, in that uh, fashion, I'll get more horizontal edges. If I pass it diagonal, I get diagonal edges. And I can also of course, modulate the uh, frequency of that wavelet by picking up high frequency and low frequency type of results. So we can apply this to our geophysical data. That is here. So we um, we have here specific wavelets or the higher wavelets. We're going to go into this in detail. This can be uh, looked up in several books on signal processing. So imagine this is your geophysical response. So uh, the first is typically some kind of an average of the geophysical response in terms of the wavelet coefficients. So this picture are now wavelet coefficients. We notice, of course, that because we're in a, in a horizontally continuous uh, uh, system, we're not getting much of any vertical uh, changes. We're getting a lot of horizontal changes. And so the second uh, part here is more of a derivative of this image. You see that you're looking here for change. So change happens here from blue to red which is this zone, and from red to blue, which would be then, uh, that particular zone. And so what is now of interest is not necessarily where exactly these blacks and whites are, but the histogram of these. So we can all put this in, 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 in histograms. And then what we're interested in, if we have two models, so if we have two forward simulated uh, models, those are two of our data variables, we can run wave flood analysis on both, and we get two histograms. So. That allows us then to define, simply by defining a difference between those histograms, you can define a difference between those two images. And so we'll see then later what we'll be using is a multidimensional scaling. In other words, the way we'll map all this um, geophysical uh, forward model results is by, by doing a wavelet analysis and then looking at uh, wavelet analysis of all of the forward simulated models then taking a pairwise uh, comparison, say here R1 and R2, and calculate histograms of wavelet coefficients and then calculate the difference in those histograms. So the question of course now is how do you compare difference in histograms? Well, that's a, a very classical problem. Here we have a particular one method that is being used, which is the Jensen's Shannon divergence. And so uh, it's a simple method where, where first uh, you rely on the kohlbeck liebler divergence which as you notice is a kind of a measure of entropy. Uh, it's a comparison based on log uh, rather than comparison based on actual values. And that makes sense, uh, of course, when you're dealing with uh, percentages. Uh, and so the kohlbeck lieber itself is not a distance, it's asymmetric. So in order to make it symmetric, uh, we use this, uh, this equation here. So what that provides us is that for each of the uh, simulated uh, data realizations, uh, now we have a table, a distance of, of uh, sorry, a table of distances of the difference in response between any two of those realizations.
So for the previous analysis, what I've obtained is basically a table of L times L that measures the difference between any of the two model realizations. And also, uh, actually, it's a table of L plus 1 times L plus 1 because it also includes the actual observations. So and here's our falsification step. So we now mapped everything into a lower dimensional space. And we notice, for example, that if you look at two eigenvalues, we get about 60% of variance. So that's already uh, pretty nice uh, in terms of compressing all this information physical information into very low dimensions, you could say that maybe you need about 20 or something to get to 80% uh, of variance. So with that low dimensional representation, uh, we notice that our observation uh, lies within the cloud, uh, and it seems also to lie with a cloud of certain colors, which has to do with one of the 16 uh, of our um, possible scenarios. Okay, so obviously our prior model can predict this observation, so that's not uh, what do we do next? Well, next we can actually do something more. Is, as I showed in the previous slide, there seems that the, the, that star lies around a group of points where there's a certain uh, type of class of models that are occurring. And this is a general thing you can do. If you're in a low dimensional space, such as this one here, which was created with some curves. So here we have our actual observation. These are the forward simulated data. So this is our DL. We do dimension reduction. So we now go in lower dimensions and we have now uh, the D star ops and the D star L, we have all these points. We can also color these points with uh, a particular model parameter. For example, it could be the channel width or the hydraulic conductivity mean. And so from that, we can now, as you can see that, you can start estimating densities. In fact, the density you can estimate is simply the density of points, uh, which is uh, you can estimate by uh, a method called kernel density estimation. And I refer to the book uh, for how that exactly done. It's simply a smoothing of these points into plot like this. So where you have more points over here, you have a higher value of that density. So red means higher density. And so our observations lie somewhere over, over here. So clearly f of d star evaluated in d up star is not zero. It has a certain value. I can also do the same uh, and smooth this one, which is just one higher dimension. And once I have this one, I have that one, I can calculate actually the conditional distribution of a model parameter given the observation. So, and that's kind of interesting because I've in, in what I've now obtained is I've turned my prior uncertainty on the model parameters, which was just f of mi, into some kind of posterior distribution of the model parameter given the observation without ever doing any explicit inverse modeling. So if you look at our particular case, uh, remember we had 16 scenarios. So a priori, all the scenarios were equally probable, namely one over 16. And after uh, our little exercise of, of density estimation, we find now that scenario six and eight and 14 are the only remaining scenarios. Actually, 14 is as a very low probability. So that's uh, what we can assess quite rapidly using this method. Okay, let's now go back to our real case study. We do exactly the same thing. Uh, so we calculate these uh, differences in, uh, in distributions and we map those into low dimensional space and a plot observation. So here's an example where you have uh, noticed 44% and 21% of variance. That's already 65% of variance. And we also color this plot. So each, sorry, each dot here corresponds to a, a data response, which comes, uh, responds to a model. And so in that model, we have a particular value of, of the parameter. So here we notice that the parameter value is uh, high, and here we still that the parameter value is low. So we notice that our observations lie more into the high end of the parameter value than the low end. So that will give us an idea that indeed seismic is indicative of large channel width and seems to be seems to eliminate a low channel width. So we can then uh, update the probabilities as before. So we have, remember we had two uh, rock physics models. So it turns out that the second rock physics model with four lithologies uh, is required and not necessarily the uh, the first model. In terms of the stacking pattern, we see that random is probably uh, is become less likely and vertical has become more likely. And so also with the other parameters. Um, here's some more parameters, uh, the lateral stacking um, and vertical stacking. We have different uh, widths and heights. And so you can see that all these are posterior distributions and, and this is the prior distribution. So we get a lot of updating in those parameters. And probably what's the most important parameter is that we have now an updated uncertainty on the proportion of oil sands. And that gives us an indication here that indeed it seems relatively favorable is that we have, we have removed these low case scenarios somewhat and we seem to be around uh, 17 with some uncertainty 
uh, in that proportion. And so uh, we get here direct inference on the oil sand proportion, which then get, uh, goes into an uncertainty quantification on the original oil in place, which, which also depends on other factors. So in summary, I think this is a really nice case where uh, with simple Monte Carlo for modeling dimension reduction, we can already start to understand a lot about the system we are studying in terms of uncertainty quantification and how model uncertainty relates to the data observations.